PV Electrician by Hector V. Bello, April 2020. Area 1, Electrical Work Hazards. Area Goals, to recognize important electrical conditions. Recognize electrical hazards. Prevent electrical accidents. Respond during and after an electrical accident. Recognize electrical hazards. It is necessary for the electrical worker to know the various electrical conditions of the components in her or his work environment. This can apply to a single or a large array of components. By electrical condition, I mean whether a component is energized or capable of becoming energized, or if a component or piece of equipment can cause electrical harm. To know the electrical condition, it is often necessary to inspect indicators, switch positions, and screens. At times, it is necessary to use test equipment, such as voltage detectors or meters. It is just as important to know what may be going on inside wiring or equipment. For this, it is necessary being familiar with some basic electrical concepts. Electricity. Electricity is simply the flow of electric charge, electrical flow, through a conductor. Electrical flow can be thought of as the flow of water, but having speeds that can near the speed of light and be many times more powerful. Voltage and current. Electrical flow needs a source of pressure to move it along. This pressure is called voltage. Think of voltage as a bucket full of water. Electrical flow, in the other hand, is the rate of flow of electric charge, commonly called current. Think of current as the stream of water escaping from the bucket through a pipe. In this example, if you tried to plug the pipe with your finger, you would feel the pressure exerted by the weight of the water in the bucket. This pressure compares to electrical voltage. If you unplug the pipe and just feel the flow as water rushes past your finger, this compares to electrical current. Since electrical charge is many times faster and more powerful than water, if it escapes its safe path, it can cause great damage to persons or materials. The amount of voltage present in a system is an indicator of the amount of electrical danger. So higher voltages equal to higher potential. However, the real cause of electrical danger is the current or the flow caused by the available voltage, the pressure. Electrical current heats up the material it is in contact with. Too much current can cause enough heat to burn most materials. Persons that come in contact with electrical current, even in small amounts, can become the conductors for this current. Current can travel through a person's body and cause severe damage to body tissue internally and externally. Current can cause enough heating for body tissue to burn, and even a small amount of current again can cause your muscles to contract and shake violently, which can prevent you from releasing the source of energy. Recognize electrical hazards. Hazards are the conditions that allow for accidents to occur. Accidents can cause injury or death. Electrical hazards are those hazards specific to electrical work. Electrical wiring. Wiring are the most common type of electrical conductors. They are installed to carry electrical charge and electrical flow within. Wires range from very thin for as for a small electronic to the very large as the ones used for transmission lines. Wires are made of metallic strands that extend the length of the wire. In some cases, the solid wiring is just one uh, larger strand. These strands or Solid wiring are covered with a flexible insulation material, which is sometimes rubber. 
Wiring can be exposed or hidden in buildings or other structures. Wires can be installed within walls or in conduits, sometimes called electrical piping. Up on power lines overhead, wiring can be exposed. Thus, for our immediate purposes, wiring can be classified as level, overhead, or underground. Level wiring. Level wiring is all wiring that can be easily accessible by persons without the use of ladders or other lift equipment. Overhead wiring. Overhead wiring are generally outdoors to carry electricity into buildings and from power station to power station, usually called power transmission. Overhead wiring may also be installed in large buildings, in ceilings or attics. Outdoor overhead wiring may not be insulated and generally carry high voltages. Remember, high voltages have the potential for high currents. Finally, underground wiring. Underground wiring can be used to carry electricity to buildings or for power transmission again from station to station. Electrical equipment. Electrical equipment is any piece of technology that can be energized. A light switch, an electrical panel, and a motor are three examples of electrical equipment. Electrical equipment may have an on-off switch, but often does not. Some equipment is hardwired or connected permanently to its power source. Equipment may come on automatically or remotely, so electrical workers must be clear of equipment that may be suddenly energized. Electrical shocks. Electrical charge is always looking to return to the center of the earth. Keep this important concept in mind. Electrical charge can only be harnessed by enclosing it in insulation and can be restrained by cutting off its path of travel, usually through a switch. For example, when electric charge is in a wire, it is insulated by the wire's flexible protective jacket. However, if the electric charge finds the slightest cut in that wire, it can, be, it can use that shortcut to go to a conductor. Persons can become the shortcuts or conductors in which the electrical charge can travel and receive an electrical shock. Electrical shocks can vary in severity depending on such factors as body size, humidity in the skin, level of hydration, humidity in the air, etc. Generally, humidity increases the severity of electrical shocks. A severe electrical shock can cause death by electrocution. Electrocutions account for 8% of all work-related fatalities in 2018. That is per the U.S. Department of Labor. As mentioned, even a small amount of current through the body can cause great harm. On the screen now, where it shows the average effects of electric current on body. On the left column, we see the amount of current. On the right column, we see the likely effects on the body. Up to 0.001 amperes, you can feel a slight tingle. Up to 0.01 amperes could cause dangerous muscle constri contractions. Up to 0.1 amperes. It could be fatal after several seconds, and more than 0.1 amperes is usually fatal. Electrical arcs. Electric charge can travel not only through conductors, but through the air. If voltage and current are high enough, electric charge may travel through the air and cause great damage. This is an electrical arc or an arc flash. Electrical arcs can cause an explosion of extremely high temperature and pressure and eject molten metal or molten material outward. Electrical arcs are extremely dangerous to persons nearby. Arcs can cause blindness, severe injury, or even death. Shorts and ground faults. A short is when electric charge finds a shorter, less resistant path to the ground it causes charge to bypass electrical components. This condition develops large amounts of current in wiring 
or components and can cause dangerous heating or fires. A ground fault can be caused by exposed wiring touching other exposed components that are connected to earth or are, that are grounded. Ground faults can energize commonly not energized wires and components and expose persons to electric charge and shock. Other electrical work related hazards. There are a myriad of other electrical work related hazards, some of which can cause overexertion, strikes, falls, eye injuries, hand injuries, foot injuries, or back injuries. Many other hazards may be present in the work area. Overexertion. Electrical work is often physically demanding, at times requiring long work days, work in extreme temperatures, and performing strenuous and repetitive motions. Many electrical tasks are mechanical in nature, such as pipe bending, pulling wire, and hardware installation. So for electrical workers, injuries or injuries due to overexertion are quite common. Overexertion injuries include back injuries, heat stress injuries, and long-term disabling injuries to hands, wrists, shoulders, and other joints. Overexertion is the cause for the most work-related injuries in the United States. That's per the National Safety Council, 2019. Struck by. Struck by are the second most common workplace injury in the United States, that's per the National Safety Council 2019. Often motorized equipment are used in work sites. Electricians often use lift trucks, motorized cable pullers, and other hydraulic lifts. Being struck by or pinned in between are hazards encountered when around motorized equipment. Falls are the third most common workplace injury and the leading cause of fatalities in the workplace in the United States. That's, for, that's per the United States Department of Labor 2018. Reaching high up areas will always be a necessity for electricians. Ladders and other lift equipment are often used to help electrical workers reach certain work areas. Falls can occur when working on elevated surfaces such as rooftops or when using lift machines and equipment. Eye injuries. Eye injuries can arise as consequences of poor choices while performing electrical work. Electrical work require the use of tools and materials with sharp or blunt edges that can cause cuts or blows to the eyes. Additionally, electrical arcs can cause blinding flashes and sprays of sparks and metal to the eyes and face. Hand injuries. Most electrical work require your hands, including the use of hand tools and machines. This requirement often exposes your hands and arms to cuts, lacerations, punctures, crushing, and burns. Naturally, electrical shock is most likely to occur through your hands. Hand injuries can cause lasting or permanent disabilities. Foot injuries. Often electrical work requires the use of heavy materials and equipment and motorized equipment. This means your feet can be exposed to injury from falling or moving materials and equipment. Crush, pinch, or cut points on motorized equipment can cause serious and permanent injuries to the feet while performing electrical work. Common sources of foot injury are falling heavy objects or running over by heavy equipment like forklifts. Back injuries. The most common part of the body injured by overexertion is your back. That's per the National Safety Council 2019. Lifting installing or otherwise moving heavy materials or equipment can cause a lasting or permanent back injury. Protect from hazards. The goal of eliminating blocking and communicating hazards are to protect from hazards. 
here are some ways to protect from the specific hazards of struck by, overexertion, and falls. In addition, we'll discuss how to prevent eye, hand, foot, and back injuries. Eliminate hazards. The most effective way to prevent an injury is to eliminate the conditions that make the hazard possible. An example of eliminating the hazard of falls is by eliminating or substituting the job that requires work in elevated areas. Completely eliminating hazards are often time and resource consuming and can be impractical. Block hazards. The second most effective way to prevent workplace injury is to place a barrier between workers and the hazard. For example, a non-conductive fence separating workers from energized wiring can effectively block workers from electrical shock hazards in that area. As no block method is 100% effective, workers should be aware of the hazards and respect the established barrier. Lockout tagout. Lockout tagout, sometimes called lotto, is an effective way to block and at the same time communicate hazards. During lockout, a padlock or similar locking device is placed on a power source or switch or circuit breaker. This is done before working on that piece of equipment operated by the switch or the circuit breaker. And this is done to prevent someone from energizing the equipment. Your name, photograph, worker identification number, and telephone number are often a requirement to be placed on the label that goes on the lockout device. A tagout is when a durable tag is securely attached to the switch to warn others not to energize a particular switch or circuit breaker. Generally, the tag must also contain your name, photograph, worker identification number, and telephone number. Your information on these lockout tagout devices are important so you can be contacted in the event you forget to unlock the switch or circuit breaker when you are done working on the equipment, or if someone needs more information about what you are doing. Often, Locks and tags are used together, thus called lockout tagout. Again, lotto. Communicate hazards. Among the most effective ways to prevent accidents and injuries is to verbally communicate hazards. Verbally communicating hazards involve formally training and reminding electrical workers of specific hazards present. Hazards can change depending on factors like working conditions, type of task performed, stage of the construction, etc. For example, installing an electrical panel in a new construction has different hazards than performing the same task on an existing building. As you are more likely to encounter live or energized wiring in an existing building. There are different ways to communicate hazards through tag out, talks, and training, and signs. Tag out. As discussed in Lotto, tag out requires the use of a durable tag with your identifying information and highly visible warning text that states the purpose of the tag, such as do not operate. Tags can warn others who may not be aware of your location, hazards present, and what you're doing. Tags cannot physically block someone from operating a switch, so they cannot be relied on for tasks that may put someone in great danger while working. If used, tags should be durable and be secured with a durable fastener. Talks and training. Regular talks about all expected hazards that may be encountered that day are an effective form of preventing accidents in the workplace. Also, training and education on the nature of electricity energized equipment and the hazards they pose should be performed regularly. 
It is widely accepted that daily safety talks are the most effective. Signs. Signs are the last line of defense against accidents. Signs may have text, graphics, or both. Signs may include warning or caution messages to communicate specific hazards in a particular area or for a particular piece of equipment. Signs should never be the only form of hazard communication to prevent accidents, but should be used in conjunction with other hazard communication methods. Protect from electrical hazards. The goal of eliminating, blocking, and communicating electrical hazards are to protect from those hazards. Here are some ways to protect from various specific electrical hazards. Protect from electrical wiring. Accessible wiring. Accessible wiring has the advantage of being easy to reach for installation and maintenance purposes. But it has the disadvantage of being more accessible to unsuspecting or untrained individuals that may touch it and receive an electrical shock. Accessible wiring, if exposed, must be kept away from. Do not work on live wiring if possible, as work on live wiring should always, always be avoidable. Very seldom is wiring ever exposed if installed properly and per code. Note, a code is a regulation generally found in the National Electrical Code, or NEC, which is a publication from the National Fire Protection Association, or NFPA. Electricians should read and closely follow the latest version of the NEC. The NEC is a comprehensive guide to perform safe installations of electrical systems. It is widely used by engineers and electricians. Damaged wiring is more likely to cause shocks. Nicks and cuts in the wiring protective jacket can cause a path for electric charge to escape. Even if you are near a damaged wire, the electric charge may jump or arc into a less resistive path to earth. This less resistive path may be your finger or a tool that you may be holding. That is why distance is so important. Overhead wiring. Overhead wiring is likely located outdoors and often carrying high voltages. Never use extension ladders near overhead wiring. Never use poles or other far reaching equipment or tools near overhead wiring. Lift or boom vehicles are especially dangerous to operate near overhead wiring. The likelihood of electrocution is high if you come in contact with overhead wiring since it's often uninsulated without protective jacket. There are various recommended distance requirements when working near various types of overhead wires, so consult the NEC if this type of work is necessary. Underground wiring. Underground wiring is generally hidden from view and can only be buried inches from the surface. There is a danger of damaging this underground wiring when excavating and causing harm to persons. Before excavating, even by hand, a permit must be granted to prevent contacting a live underground wire. If working in the electrical system of an existing structure, the service entrance drop is often a underground wire or cable called a feeder that follows a direct path from the transformer to the service entrance panel. Avoid excavating near this area. In fact, when performing electrical work, do not excavate anywhere without a permit. When a permit is acquired, the area to avoid excavating will be clearly marked by the power provider. Protect from electrical equipment. Electrical equipment has, uh, that is accessible may be energized. Ensure it is not live before working on it. 
if working on live equipment is absolutely necessary the proper PPE will be necessary at times it is more cumbersome and time-consuming to don the appropriate PPE than to just shut off and lock the power for example to safely work on a electrical component of over 50 volts you are required to wear rubber insulated gloves with cloth inserts and leather gloves switch location and styles may be different in different equipment don't rely on labels or indicator light colors or on switch orientation to determine if an equipment is operating or not manufacturers may use any color to indicate a on or off status the international symbol for the on is the one or the I and for the off position is the zero or the O but always ensure that equipment is off by means other than the state of a switch or indicating light because those can easily fail using a voltage tester can determine if equipment is getting power by checking its wiring see the figure on the screen protect from electrical shocks gloves distance is the best protection from shock but insulated gloves can help protect against shock if you must work on live wiring insulated gloves range in voltage protection so ensure you select the correct pair to work with remember to read the user's instructions thoroughly before using insulated gloves insulated gloves require a high degree of care when using and when storing ensure you properly test your insulated gloves before each use and regularly inspect them uh, per the manufacturer's recommendation Footwear. Ensure you use electrical hard toe shoes if at all possible and if you will work on live electrical equipment. Insulated mats are also options to further prevent shock. Avoid working in humid or wet areas when working on live equipment. Eye protection. Eye protection is essential when working on live equipment sparks can cause hot debris to spray your face and eyes goggles and face shields may be necessary when working with higher voltages or if gases or sparks are possible consult established guidelines when working on live equipment to determine the level of protection necessary these guidelines can be found in the latest publication of the NFPA 78E oh, the NFPA 70E is a publication with recommended guidelines for safe electrical work practices see the figure protect from electrical arcs arc flash gear arc flash gear is PPE designed to protect from various levels of arc flash arc flash gear is a determined set of PPE required to wear during work on live equipment and live wiring arc flash gear at a minimum include insulated gloves leather gloves protective clothing leather shoes safety glasses hard hat and face shield there are four established categories of arc flash from one through four each category is a requirement depending on the amount of energy potential available in the equipment or wiring being worked on see the figure on your right side electricians must wear arc flash gear if the job calls for it consult the latest publication of the NFPA 70E for requirement details protect from struck by hazard 
Being struck by a moving vehicle or machine is the number two cause of death in the construction industry. That's per the United States Department of Labor, 2019. Continuous awareness of these moving vehicles and machines is important to keep a safe distance and prevent being struck by them. Establishing eye contact and using established hand signals to communicate with operators of moving equipment is important to prevent being struck. Wearing highly visible and reflective clothing can warn moving equipment operators of your location. However, maintaining a safe distance from moving or operating equipment is the best way to prevent being struck by them. Stationary motorized equipment. Stationary motorized equipment can cause serious injury. Electrical workers use motorized cable pullers cable cutters and cable crimpers and other equipment that can cause serious limb injury. Users of these equipments should always be trained on their safe use and read their respective owner's manual. Equipment guards should be installed and kept in place while in use. Never remove a guard for convenience or to speed up the process. Clean the guards as needed to allow for visibility but only when the equipment is de-energized. Moving motorized equipment. Moving motorized equipment can cause serious injury. Electrical workers use many of the same equipment other construction trades use, such as excavators, forklifts, and boom trucks. The users of these equipment should be trained on their safe use and read their respective owner's manual. Special attention should be placed on keeping your distance from moving motorized equipment as the operator may not be able to see you if you stand too close. You must maintain eye contact with operators and remain clear of the reach of their machinery while it is operating. Personal Protective Equipment or PPE PPE is the last line of defense against struck by injury. Although they are the last line of defense, they should always be worn during work. PPE are any highly visible clothing or protective equipment worn to prevent injuries. Protective equipment are safety glasses, hearing protection or earmuffs, face shields, hard hats, hard toe boots, insulated gloves, etc. Note, in North America, the American National Standards Institute, or ANSI ANSI, approves the necessary quality and design of PPE. Ensure the ANSI approved mark is printed on the safety equipment worn. Ensure you read the user's manual and or instructions for PPE and follow their recommendations closely. Many PPE require training prior to use. Personal Protective Equipment or PPE PPE is the last line of defense against struck by injury. Although they are the last line of defense, they should always be worn during work. PPE are any highly visible clothing or protective equipment worn to prevent injuries. Protective equipment are safety glasses, hearing protection or earmuffs, face shields, hard hats, hard toe boots, insulated gloves, etc. Note, in North America, the American National Standards Institute or ANSI ANSI approves the necessary quality and design of PPE. Ensure the ANSI approved mark is printed on the safety equipment worn. Ensure you read the user's manual and or instructions for PPE and follow their recommendations closely. Many PPE require training prior to use. Protect from overexertion hazard. Overexertion is the most reported injury in the workplace. That's per the National Safety Council 2019. 
overexertion injuries can be caused by excessive repetitive and strenuous body or limb movements back neck or joints wrist and shoulder injuries are common overexertion injuries limiting excessive repetitive and strenuous movements may be the best way to prevent overexertion injuries body conditioning such as stretching and warming up helps minimize the occurrence of overexertion rest recovery breaks good hydration and nutrition also minimize or prevent overexertion injuries protect from fall hazard falls are the second most reported type of accident and can cause severe injury or even death when lifting equipment is involved such as ladders or lift trucks falls can be more lethal limiting limiting the need for elevated work is the best way to minimize dangerous falls good housekeeping and organization of the work area also minimize trips and falls roping off or visibly marking holes excavations and areas with debris or materials can prevent falls ladders using ladders of quality construction and good condition is important to prevent falls while using them electrical work requires non-conductive ladders such as fiberglass or wood step ladders see figure one are common for inside work ensure the locking arm is fully ex fully extended and that you never stand on the top of the ladder or on the last rung extension ladders such as those shown in figure three are commonly used outdoors and need to be propped on a stable surface such as a wall if using an extension ladder in uneven terrain ensure it has independently adjustable and lockable extending legs called levelers to maintain the ladder in a level position see figure 2 ensure the ground where the ladder legs stand won't allow the ladder to sink or slip use extreme care if working on icy conditions the extension ladders base should be positioned at one fourth or one quarter of the height away from the point on the wall where it is propped see figure 3 if the ladder is propped at 14 feet for example divide 14 into 4 so the base should be at 3.5 feet 3.5 feet from the wall that's 3 feet 6 inches Scaffolding is often used to gain access to long-term work areas. Wood scaffolding is the safest for electrical work, but often metal scaffolding is used. Ensure the scaffolding is secure, securely con constructed and that metallic scaffolding is electrically grounded. Ensure scaffolding wheels are locked before used. Ensure that scaffolding is on level ground or adjust it to remain level. Always use ladders to climb onto the scaffolding. Elevated work. Elevated work, such as working on rooftops, poles, towers, etc., present a set of fall hazards that require specific training. In general, a fall protection body harness must be used in conjunction with a fall protection strap system to use with approved tie-off points. Using rail systems, nets, and scaffolding can also be used to prevent falls. Ensure specific and thorough training is acquired and fall protection equipment is used before attempting any elevated electrical work. Protect from eye injury. Eye injuries can be disabling and cause loss of sight. Eye injury can be best prevented by avoiding or limiting tasks that pose eye injury risks such as welding, hammering, working with live wiring, and working with items that may cause parks or the ejection of debris such as batteries. Additionally, electrical arcs can severely damage the eyes with blinding light, heat, and molten material. Approved safety glasses should always be worn while working. 
in North America ensure the Z87 mark is on eye protection. The ANSI ICEA Z87.1-2005-2015 standard prescribe the design and performance specification for eye and face protection equipment. Lastly, face shields should be worn while working with high voltage or performing spark or debris causing tasks. Protect from hand injury. Hand injury can be prevented by limiting tasks that put the hands at risk of injury such as sawing, using sharp or heavy tools, and using powered equipment and tools. Using the correct method for using hand and power tools can also prevent most hand injuries. Using the correct types of gloves for work tasks is an important step to prevent hand injury. For example, insulating gloves should be worn if there's a chance of electrical shock while working on electrical equipment. Cut resistant gloves should be used when working with any tool or object that may cause cuts. Proper fit and flexibility of gloves are essential for hand safety. Avoid torn or brittle gloves. Hand tools. Hand tools selection can prevent severe hand injury. Hand tools should be used for the job that they were designed to do. Do not improvise or modify hand tools or the way they should be used to save time. Use quality tools that are in good condition worn or broken tools can cause injury if they fail during work. Insulation on electrical hand tools should be present and undamaged. Do not work on energized equipment if at all possible, but if it is absolutely necessary use proper voltage rated insulated hand tools and use extreme care not to touch live parts. Power tools Power tools can cause even more severe injury than hand tools. Rotary tools or bladed tools can cause deep cuts or amputations to fingers and other limbs. So use cut resistant gloves and sleeves when using these tools. Do not use power tools in disrepair or missing guards or safety mechanisms. Don't make the common mistake of omitting to read the user's manual when using a power tool, especially for the first time. It has many recommendations vital for the safe use of that tool. Foot injury prevention. As usual, the best prevention method is to avoid areas and tasks where your feet can be injured. Avoid areas with debris, water, or any electrical hazard. Falling objects can injure the foot in cases causing disabling injuries and amputations. Moving equipment can crush toes. Of course, if you must work in areas where foot injury is possible, wearing hard toe shoes can greatly minimize injury. There are many types of hard toe shoes, so be careful in selecting them. Uh, careful selection is necessary to ensure the best level of protection. For example, in electrical work, non-conductive hard toe shoes are recommended, sometimes called electrical toe. Lastly, being aware of your surroundings and using good judgment can prevent or keep your feet safe by preventing unnecessary risks. For example, correctly positioning and securing a heavy load or object can prevent them from falling on your or someone else's feet. Back injury. Back injuries are the most common type of overexertion injury in the workplace. A back injury can occur in an instant or it can build up over a longer period. Sudden and excessive force or, or movement exerted by the back muscles can cause back injury. A pulled back muscle or herniated spine disc are examples of mild to severe back injuries. A herniated spine disc can cause permanent disabling injury and require risky surgery. To avoid all that, correct lifting techniques must be employed while working. Also avoid excessive, repetitive and strenuous use of your back muscles. 
don't cut corners and avoid asking for help when lifting heavy items. It is best to take a bit longer and avoid serious injury. Wearing back support belts may aid in maintaining correct back positioning while working, but may cause you to be complacent and overexert. Some tight-fitting back support belts may restrict normal blood circulation, thus defeating their purpose. Follow the proper lifting technique to prevent back injury as seen on the next chart. Step one is to position your feet about shoulder width apart. Second step is to bend mostly at your knees. Third step is to keep the load as close to your body as possible. Fourth step is to lift up without twisting your back. Fifth step is to turn by moving feet and not your back. Sixth step is when lifting with a partner, clearly communicate each movement. Respond during and after an electrical accident. The author recommends all electrical workers to enroll in a certified cardiopulmonary resuscitation, CPR, and first aid course, commonly given by the American Red Cross and the American Heart Association in North America. This training may one day help you save the life of a co-worker or even a loved one. If an accident is encountered, attempt to follow the next steps. First, call for help. When encountering an accident, calling for help should be the first thing done unless immediate action is needed to save yourself or aid others. Calling for help can be getting the attention of other people able to help or calling the emergency responders such as the emergency medical service or EMS, the fire department or the police. Calling 911 from any telephone should put you in contact with emergency responders here in the Americas. Second step is to protect the victim. Turn off the power source if possible. If the power source cannot be located, move the power conductor away from the victim with a non-conductive instrument such as a piece of wood, dry wood. Third step should be to perform first aid. If the victim is confirmed un unresponsive and not breathing, a trained and certified person should perform CPR. Keep in mind that electrical shock victims may have suffered internal organ damage and other injuries caused by secondary factors such as falls and impacts. Don't move the victim unless it is necessary. If an electrical shock or an arc event victim is found conscious, help should be called immediately and first aid provided as necessary. First aid can be as simple as protecting a wound or as involved as applying a tourniquet. Ensure first aid is rendered only by trained persons and only if needed until professional emergency responders arrive. Electrical fires. Electrical fires are dangerous because often plastics and metals are set ablaze, releasing toxic fumes and potentially causing severe burns or asph asphyxiation. Electrical fires can be more difficult to extinguish than ordinary combustible fires. So first called for help. If the fire is small or contained, attempt to put it out with a Class C fire extinguisher. If the fire gets out of control, evacuate the area immediately and help others do the same. It is recommended that electrical workers be trained in using different types of portable fire extinguishers. The basic method to use a common portable fire extinguisher is the PASS method, that's P-A-S-S which is the acronym for pull, aim, squeeze, and sweep. At the side of a starting fire, get the fire extinguisher and pull its pin. Aim at the base of the fire and squeeze the trigger and hold it. Then spray the base of the fire with a sweeping motion. Shown on the screen are the steps recommended for using the pass to extinguish a small fire.
here are the area goals just discussed. Recognize important electrical conditions, recognize electrical hazards, prevent electrical accidents, and respond during and after an electrical accident. This has been Area 1, Electrical Work Hazards, PV Electrician by Hector V. Bello, April 2020.